country. She has a new book. It is called A Chance to Make History, What Works and What Doesn't in Providing an Excellent Education for All. I am pleased to have her back on this program. Welcome. Thank you. Where are we? And what must we do to reach the goals that we would like to achieve? Well, you know, my, my fundamental message was that we have made extraordinary progress in the last 20 years, and yet it is humbling to realize how much is left to be done. You know, to the first point, though, you know, 20 years ago, the prevailing notion backed up by all the research at the time was that students' socioeconomic background determined their educational right. outcomes and in turn life outcomes. Today, we know that that's not true. We have all over the country, not only whole classrooms of kids whose teachers you know, put them on a different trajectory, but now literally hundreds of whole schools in the most under-resourced areas in the country that are taking whole buildings full of kids who face all the extra challenges of poverty and putting them on a completely different trajectory than their socioeconomic background would predict. Um, so, so we know something we didn't know, you know 20 years ago. And is that scalable? I deeply believe that it is. But it's a big um, question. That is the new question, and, and that's progress, right? I mean, before we were asking, can this be done? Today we're asking, can we scale it? And even to that question, you know, I look at the progress that's been made in the last five years. Five years ago, if we had brought our education policy leaders together and had asked them, what are the most impossible to move school systems in the country? We would have had a big debate, but certainly they would have said New Orleans, Washington, D.C. are near the top of the pack, and those are two of the fastest improving urban school systems in the country right now. We have seen a level of policy change in this country in the last two years that is completely unprecedented, policy change that is rooted in the learnings of what is going on differently in these schools that I would call transformational schools. And, and what are those learnings? You know, I think always, so I think about you know, a school, say, North Star Elementary School in Newark, New Jersey, right? Now, I walk down, th this, this school is taking its students who are almost all receiving free and reduced price lunch, you know, African American students, students who are coming in, you know, significantly behind, and it's putting them, I mean, it's literally, this is one of the highest performing elementary schools in the whole state of New Jersey, irrespective of, of economic background of the kids. I walked down the hallway of this school and saw student work on the walls um, that literally, you know, on an absolute scale, just stunning student work. Kindergartners writing in full sentences in both English and Spanish, just stunning on an absolute scale of excellence. So what is going on differently here? There's a school leader, uh, Julie Jackson, who has embraced a different mandate for public school than most of our public schools have. I mean, most public schools, most private schools, most schools in general view their mandate as to put learning opportunities in front of kids. In this case, the mandate is different. The mandate is literally we're going to change the educational trajectory of our, our kids and, and in turn their life trajectory. And this school leader is bound and determined to do whatever it takes to accomplish that end. And she does what any great leader does when they're trying to accomplish very ambitious outcomes, which is, first of all, she fixates on attracting and developing an incredibly talented team, mm -hmm. the other teachers, the staff in her schools. It's her top priority. She does so much to build a powerful culture of achievement in that building. Just like a great leader builds a powerful culture, yeah. she manages aggressively, and then she does whatever it takes. She takes nothing as a given mm -hmm. other than the end goal. So, so the point is that you know, one, we need to embrace a different mandate for what our schools in low-income communities should accomplish, and then we need to realize this is going to take the same level of leadership, energy, discipline as it takes to accomplish extraordinary outcomes, really, in any endeavor. Yeah. I mean, one thing that you are saying, and you say in this book, is this notion that you need better teachers, yes, but that's not enough. Right. You need a culture, you need a system, and you need leadership. Yes. Uh, that extends throughout the building yes. and throughout the system. Yes. And only when you have that can you scale it up to where it ought to be. That's right. And and we should so so the question is how do we create whole systems of transformational schools? And you know, ultimately we're going to realize first of all we have to make a huge investment in developing the leadership pipeline. We need mm -hmm. more Julie Jacksons. There's no shortcut to that. Um, can you teach? I mean, can you make a Julie Jackson or is that something absolutely. are they born? I, you know, it takes. I'm talking about leadership, not the ability to teach. I think it takes um, recruiting people with real leadership characteristics into teaching. You know what they are? 
um, we've done a lot of research about it. You know, I think about leadership skills as, you know, perseverance in the face of challenges, the ability to influence and motivate others, um, problem solving ability, um, you know, critical thinking skills, you know, operating, the ability to operate effectively with a larger team, respect and humility. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in this case, I mean, we need people who have very high expectations for kids in urban and rural areas who deeply believe in kids um, and, and who are willing to work relentlessly in pursuit of that mission. What have you come to learn about why people come to Teach for America? You know, the the chief reason people come to Teach for America is because they want to make a difference. You know, they have an inclination to want to give back, to make an impact, and you know, when and, and I think Teach for America makes it possible for them to act on that inclination. It makes them possible. Makes it, it, it gives possible. Them, it gives them gives them a, a vehicle and a place where they can give back and and make a difference, make a huge impact. And where? How long do they stay with you? Um, with the they, they, well, they commit the initially system. two years, but right. you know, so we have 20,000 Teach for America alumni now, right. and 65% of them are working full time in education. Um, you know, some of them as teachers, some of them, we have about 600 school principals, many other district leaders. We think it's important that some of them leave and become policy leaders yeah. and lawyers and doctors and, you know, business people, people who can influence the overall context in which our schools function. How are we doing with, in the Obama administration with respect to support for education? Well, I, you know, we've seen a pace of change in the last, you know, three two years, years yeah. in, in, or two years in, in education policy that is completely unprecedented. And I think um, that Secretary Duncan has, you know, and, and the president have, you know, through making it a priority um, and actually acting on the lessons that we see taking, you know, in, in the transformational schools. Like they realize there's nothing elusive about this. This is about committing ourselves to high standards. It's about people and leadership. Do you want to see No Child Left Behind continued? I think there are elements of No Child Left Behind that we have to maintain. I think we took a radical step forward when we committed ourselves to transparency of data and to disaggregating data so that we could understand in any given school, you know, how are all the kids doing? Not just how are the average kids doing, but how, how are all the kids doing? And I think that that aspect of NCLB has actually changed the conversation that goes on in our school systems. I think what we saw, you know, over the last eight years is just the limitations of, of any effort to kind of centrally mandate what needs to happen in but what communities. But was the problem the way it was constructed or was the problem the way it was funded? Um, I think, well, you know, I, I actually think it's it's more than anything the way it was structured. I mean, so when, when we really ground ourselves in the lessons of these, you know, schools that are highly successful, always, they're, as I said, you know, run by a school leader who feels full ownership and commitment over the end goal, right? Mm. And yet we have a policy context that instead of focusing on attracting and developing talented, committed people and empowering them and unleashing them and saying, go after the results, we try to micromanage our educators. We have an entire policy construct, starting with NCLB at the federal level and in every state that is trying to literally control. I mean, it's built on the best of intentions and I think in many cases not a lot of faith in our educators. And, and the problem is that that will get us nothing more than incremental change. At best, we will have incremental progress. And when you really think about the dimensions of the problem I outlined before, incremental change does not change lives. We need to change whole life paths and that requires transformational change. So I think we need to step back center ourselves in the lessons of the last 20 years, which are extraordinary. We can, through education, we should try to tackle poverty. We absolutely should do everything we can to lessen poverty, but we don't need to wait for that. We can literally provide education that changes kids. And you can do it immediately, or it will take you 10 years to make sure that for all the kids across the country, you reach the level that you would like to see I mean, it is extraordinarily difficult to, to do what, what I'm talking about doing, and yet it's much more difficult for the kids, the families, and for our whole overall yeah. country, honestly, if we don't take it on. So you know, that's when, sort of the lesson of this, I think. I mean, I, when you go and, and talk to those schools, whether places like the Harlem Academy and all kinds of places mm -hmm. like that throughout, 
uh, where people have gotten their kids there by some lottery process, you know, just to talk, to, to see what happens, number one, yeah. you know, where some of the principles you talk about are there, and, mm -hmm. and everybody knows what Teach for America mm -hmm. has done, but to see the passion of the parents and what it mm -hmm. means to see their children in an environment Absolutely. that they believe will give them a better mm -hmm. life than they had. Exactly. I mean, it's just the most amazing process to see happening yeah. in front of your very eyes. I and it's all about, as you say, culture, system, leadership, Absolutely. and across the board. All the connection basics. Of, all the basics. And yeah. yet, sometimes our public discussion, yeah. you know, doesn't ultimately relate to, to what we really see happening. Can, speaking of that, yeah. can, can the teachers' union, which has taken a lot of hits, mm -hmm. can they, and are they, coming into the process in a way they're asking you know I understand how education is changing you know yeah. and we want to engage the change or I, not I think well we've certainly seen quite a bit of evidence in some districts that they are engaging and and you know being very constructive you know allies for the change effort I think you know what's unfortunate in my mind if, if we you know, changed all the unions tomorrow, and we, we, we need unions to change, we would still have largely the situation that we have today because, you know what, we need to change our districts. <laughs> um, teacher dismissal rates are the same in states that have very low unionization levels and essentially no collective bargaining as they are. They're 1% in those mm -hmm. states which just tells you we've got a larger problem. And, and my view is, you know, we all but, need but to that change. that suggests that you think the goal ought to be teacher dismissal. It's just that I think we've got a lot of people right now in this country very worked up about teacher unions. Right. Um, and I just think we should be very worked up about all, exactly. everything. Or, or, or at least maybe admit that we're all blameless, but nonetheless all commit ourselves to change and to center ourselves in the principles of success that we see at work in these schools that are putting kids on a different path. I want to touch three quick bases. Number one, you're at risk of losing some of your federal funding because uh, your $20 million yeah. worth, is that right? That's right. Because yeah. you have been, you are by definition an earmark. Right. I, I think this is a very unintended consequence of, of the whole kind of anti-earmark, anti -earmark right. you know, swirl. And I, I guess, I don't, I can't imagine, I mean, every senator and congressperson I talk to says, you're not an earmark, and yet we are. So yeah. we, we really need to clarify the definition of earmark. We're a national authorized program that operates in 31 states. That's not uh, what people think of when they think of earmark. Second, uh, Teach for America now has an international dimension. It's not just mm -hmm. Teach for America. That's right. Well, there's a global network of which Teach for America is one part right. called Teach for All. Right. Um, it's only about three or four years old, and there are 18 programs across the world that are uh, working to build movements in their country by enlisting their future leaders and committing two years to teach in under-resourced communities and then um, fostering their development as, as lifelong leaders. What's the best book you've ever read on leadership? Mm. I love Jim Collins's books, Built to Last, Good to Great. Now, what do they tell you? Um, oh, they're so true to everything I believe. They they tell you the importance of of focus and and attaining true strategic clarity and building powerful cultures and investing in, you know, first who. It's all about people. You know, I think all the lessons, honestly, that I've learned in the journey around building Teach for America itself and that I've seen to account for success in, in, in the parts of our school systems that are working in, in incredible ways. It's always about all the basics. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Carlos Fuentes is here. The New York Times has called him Mexico's most celebrated novelist.